M, what are our topics on this week's Gav and M's How to English TEFL pod? Gav, this week we deal with common pronunciation problems. We break down some words containing the prefix over. You ask how we can adapt materials. And in our quiz of the week, we get to know each other a little better. A little. Followers, if you're enjoying our show, please let your fellow classmates, teachers or school know just how much you enjoy How To English, TEFL Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's begin. Welcome everybody, this is How To English, Teach and Learn with Gav and M. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal and references will be given when necessary. Hey. Hi, Em. Hi, Gav. Welcome back to another episode of Gav and Em's How to English TEFL pod. Nice to see you. I hope you've been concentrating over the last couple of weeks, Em, and making some lovely notes for both me and the followers. Yes, Gav. My priority has been teaching, but I have reflected and made some notes at the same time. Exactly. Where did you make these notes? Got some yellow post-its as I... I think I've mentioned in the past, I am quite partial to post-its. I'm quite passionate for post-its. That's nice. Where are your notes? Mine are carefully stored on my computer under notepad. Okay, you've got sticky notes on your desktop then? Yes. Good. They're purple. Are they? Nice. Analog and digital. So let's begin, Em. As the regular followers know, we are two TAFL teachers just kind of chatting on the topic of teaching and learning. Sometimes we travel, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we teach. Actually, we teach quite a lot. Yeah, I think we do always teach. It's the common theme, Gav, is that we are teaching and we are teachers. Yeah, sometimes we do get breaks, though, in which to prepare for then the next lesson that comes up. Yes, Gav, that's true. Um, I've got a few things I'd like to discuss with you. For example, how do you teach pronunciation? Do you have a strategy? Have you got some worksheets? Do you listen to your students and think, ah, there's some errors there? Or maybe these are typical errors from speakers of that language. All of that, Gav. I, yesterday, actually, I went online and looked... I, yesterday, actually. I... Yesterday, actually, Gav, I went online and I looked for a TH word pronunciation quiz, really. TH as in Thursday or... Three. Yes. And I found a quiz with all the words ending in TH, actually. Oh, as in fourth. Yes. Or... Health. Mammoth. (laughs) Yeah, well, that word wasn't in the quiz, but we had a lot of general knowledge questions and the students enjoyed that. And then I really focused on getting them to pronounce the words afterwards. So they got the th properly done. Emma, your students must be super smart with all the general knowledge quiz questions that you ask them. Yes, Gav. And tell me more about the TH sounds. Yeah, well, it's hard for some students from some countries because they don't have that sound in their own language. So to make them put their tongue out between their teeth and then go th is quite a challenge. It does sound like a challenge, although not for you, clearly, from your demonstration. No, I think I've just covered my table in spit. But you need to practice. And that is the best way. That is very good advice. I was thinking about a few words that I've written down that my students have problems with. Could you maybe give me a little mini demonstration on how I should teach these to my students? And followers, if you're a student, you might want to pay attention to M's teaching pronunciation lesson. Here we go. Good. Okay, Gav. I love these just come out of nowhere with these lessons on the spot. Great. I came across the word spelled B-U-S-H, which was mispronounced by my student. How might my student have said it, M? Bush. Mm, And I was thinking, why are there bees buzzing around your bush? (laughs) Could have been a bus, I guess. Some kind of strange bus. So I guess they're thinking of bush. Mm. 
how would I teach that? You mean how would I teach the sound of uh, bush? I guess that was the mistake, but can I tell you what I did? Oh, you can. I thought you were asking me what I would do, but I'm more than happy for you to just tell me what you did, yeah. (laughs) I shouted, George W. Nice. And what did the student say? Bush. That's it. (laughs) Hmm, nice technique. If they know what you're talking about, if they're old enough to know who you're talking about. Fortunately, my student was. That worked out. But how would you deal with the bush bush problem? I guess put it into other word groups like push, but then you've got lush. So it's really hard. English pronunciation is a nightmare. Em, this is not the direction I want to go Sorry. with this conversation. No. Okay. Let's let's I... focus on what you said a word group. Now, what is a word group? It's a group of words. Specifically for pronunciation? Yeah, I think these words help if you maybe put them into a rhyme or a sentence. Don't push the bush. Don't push the bush, baby. Don't push the bush over. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, kind of. I like it. Well, that's one way. Right, let's make a rhyming song together with our students and see how many words we can come up with. Maybe that, but I do find sentences tend to work because there's more of a story. You know, storytelling is very popular. That is very good. What are the other words, Gav? My student had a problem with this word. And in fact, I've got a few students who mispronounce this word. O-double-P-O-S-I-T-E. Do they say... Opposite? They say opposite. Okay, the opposite at the end. Opposite. That's difficult. Opposite. If I sit opposite you, I can see your face. You can see my face. Maybe that helps. I like the way that you just repeated the word back to me, but you pronounced it correctly. I think that might stick in my head if I hear you say it enough times. Yeah, I think you can say... What was that word? And show that you're really confused like you did with the bush thing or the bush, whatever it was. And then the student recognises that that word wasn't said properly. And that might shock them a little bit to think, oh, I'm not saying it right. Or, yeah, you could just repeat it back so that they think, oh, that wasn't a good pronunciation. But sometimes I think they're not paying attention. That could be it. And also they may be using some of the rules where we say S-I-T is pronounced sit. But if we put an E on the end, we say... Sight. That's not actually a word, is it? Sight. Like site-specific buildings or (laughs) the site of of the excavation. Oh, goodness. It's been a long week at CJ. Okay. That is definitely a word. S-I-T-E. Definitely a word. I was thinking S-I-G-H-T and then got confused. But then you've got parasite, but composite. That's with an E, isn't it? Composite. Composite. Yeah. That's got an E on the end. Parasite does too, and so does opposite. So where do you start with this? I come back to my rhyming words thing. Sit opposite me. You know, those are everyday words. Maybe not composite and parasite. You wouldn't use them all the time. Opposite, though, that's a really important one. I think we need to get that one right. C-H-O-I-R. Yes, that's notoriously difficult. Pronounced choir. Yeah, if you see it written down, though, it looks like chwa. Chior. Chwa. Choir. <laughs> <laughs> many, many interpretations. I've heard them all. And the same with cough. The spelling of cough. Oh, no. It's very difficult, isn't it? I think I've heard that mispronounced as well. Cog. Or something else. Yes, yes. So what do you do? I think I show a kind of... IPA version of the word. If the students know that. But I just put KW and say it's qu. Yeah. Choir. Yeah. And hope they remember. But that's a tricky one. Yeah, it is. Can't think of anything that rhymes with choir. Desire. I desire to be in a choir. It's quite complicated. But in fact, I'm a liar because. My voice isn't higher. And I'm in a mire. Mm-hmm. That's not good, is it? Let's keep moving. Okay, maybe my voice needs to be higher for the choir. We oh, can I like that. Stop there. You could just keep repeating that and go round the classroom, repeat after me, my voice is higher when I'm in the choir. 
or that, that's also good. Yeah, any sentence that helps is a good one. C-L-O-T-H-E-S is a word that my students often mispronounce. Mine too. They always say clotheses. I get cloves. Nah. Yeah. Nah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I say when you put your clothes in the wardrobe, you close the door. That's what I say too. I say it sounds a lot like close the window, close the door, close the wardrobe. But yes. it should be a TH th rather than s. But close. maybe it'll trigger that just to remember at least it's one syllable. I think that's the most important thing. Clothes is not two separate sounds. I think it is two separate sounds. Clothes. Clothes. It's clo and s. Clothes? Yeah. Oh, I would argue that it's an extended vowel sound, but one syllable only. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but it's definitely not very distinct syllables, is it? It's more of a longer sound. But yeah, I think all these pictures in your head, thinking about little trigger words, rhyming, looking a little bit confused when they say it wrong every time. And then you can just start shouting, I guess, if yeah. it gets too much. I do animate closing doors when they tell me about their cloves. <laughs> yeah. And I think that triggers their intelligence. Yeah. Another word, W-A-N-D-E-R. Wanda. Mm. Maybe they say wanda. Or the W may be mispronounced. Vonda. Vonda. Mm-hmm. So there are some nationalities that typically mix up the V's and the W's. True. I think, again, your solution of writing many words that start with W, get the students to practice W. Can we do a quick list of W words that start with W? World. Wednesday. Wicked. When. Worry. Wish. Wall. Wobble. Waffle. Very nice list. And then we could just use those in a sentence, repeat them, go round, make some lovely rhymes. Make it memorable. That's quite nice. I quite like the game so that it really focuses just for those few minutes. Is that all of them? There's a couple more, Em. Have you got patience to listen to them? I have. I don't know if the followers have. I think the followers are gaining a lot of very useful tips right now. OK, carry on. So what could be the problem with report? Seaside and hotel. <laughs> Stress is on the wrong part of the word. It is. Yes, those are the exceptions to the rule. Because most words in English, two syllables, the stress is on the second syllable. So what I do... No, the stress is on the first, because nobody else is listening to me. The stress is on the first syllable. That's quite true, Em. But there are exceptions. And these might be them, and there may be others. What I might do, M, is I write these words in the chat or on the board and I make the second syllable sounding letters capitals. R-E would be lowercase and P-O-R-T would be caps. Mm -hmm. So that becomes report. Nice. And decide, small d-e, capital C-I-D-E, decide. Good. You could put those on cards or something as well if you wanted to. Have lots of fun playing games, maybe mixing them up with other words that don't have the bigger letters that are all just mixed up together. They have to differentiate which ones are on the first syllable and which are on the second syllable. Cool activity. Last ones. Island cupboard plumber. Silent letters. Mm, yeah. Those tricksters. They're going to get you. Climbing. This one's also one of them. I would add that to the list too. And salmon. Yep. And I did it in a table of corresponding silent letters. So a column of silent T letters, a column of silent K letters. And then just go through each column, check the words, check the students know the words, check they can pronounce the words. And then I wrote sentences that had those words included all mixed up. And it was a kind of game to see if the students could say the sentence without making any mistakes. And they got a point if they said it completely correctly the first time or if anyone noticed a mistake. So they were listening out for each other's errors, which was quite good. That sounds like a wonderful game. I would like to play that myself. You can. Maybe next time. <laughs> Thanks, Em. I've also had a wordy week. 
A wordy, wordy week. A word? No, just the one wordy week. The week has been full of words. But that's what it should be, Em. You're a wordster within your classroom. I work with words. So, I made a worksheet based on words with over and the confusion with the meanings of these words. I'm already confused. What do you mean over? So, if I can elicit them from you, Gav, maybe it's possible. You can try. And would you also like the followers to guess the over words? Of course. If your boss asks you to write a uh, maybe short text with some bullet points, like a summary of something, you've written an... An overview. You have written an overview. If your boss asks you to maybe check and monitor somebody or a project or some kind of process so that you're standing, watching and checking, then what are you doing? I would be overseeing someone or something. Nice. So we've got overview, as we've said, and we've got oversee. But view and see are quite similar words, aren't they? But we use them differently, Em. We That's do. That's the point. So what does oversight mean? If oversee is to manage or supervise, what is an oversight, the noun of that word, see? I would use oversight to mean that I had missed something while I was checking off a list, for example. Yeah, so it's got nothing to do with supervising or managing anybody. It's a completely different word. So even though it's using C in the noun, oversight is a mistake. So this one is a noun and the others were verbs? Yes. No, because the first one was an overview, which was a noun. Oh. Yeah. I don't say overviewing something. No. So, Maybe I'm looking it over. So we've got overview, which is a summary. We've got oversee, which is to supervise. We've got oversight, which is a mistake. But if you've made that mistake, there is an oversight. Mm -hmm. What have you done? What's the action? You have... Blundered. Yeah, but over... I've overlooked something, Em. You've overlooked it. I missed it. So overlook is the same as oversight. I overlooked something and it became an oversight. That's right. But oversee is not in any way connected. You have to oversee that nobody's overlooking anything and making oversights. I guess I couldn't make an oversight if I hadn't been overseeing something. You could, if you were just making a Word document or something, or an Excel sheet and you overlook something. That's true. I'm not supervising, am I? No. But maybe somebody should oversee what you're doing to check you haven't. Made an oversight. <laughs> yeah, it's very confusing. Em, is this over now? No, there's one more, only one more. If you're on a bus and you're aware of a conversation happening behind you, which you're not part of, but you just think, oh, that's interesting. What are you doing? I'm overhearing. You are overhearing. And in some languages, to overhear means to not hear. Oh. Which is very confusing because if you overhear something in English, you're definitely hearing something. While not being part of that conversation. Yeah. It's worth getting into these words, but I don't think I've really found a way to teach it that is not really confusing. <laughs> that is very confusing, but I like your context and I like you putting me on a bus or saying I was filling in a report or maybe I was in charge of something. Yeah. That made it very clear. That's how I started. I did a lot of elicitation. I did a lot of checking, a lot of error correction because a lot of the time it was the wrong word. Then I had a sheet of questions and the classic gap fill, they had to put the right word into the space. And I think by the end of it, they were getting it. But yeah, I think they were glad it was over. Mm. <laughs> Emma, we're going to do under next week. If you want. Followers, let us know. <laughs> Good. This week, I was thinking particularly about how to adapt materials. I think this is a big topic for TEFL teachers and I don't know if students are aware but we do need to adapt some of our materials to make them more suitable for different situations, different environments. What are your thoughts on that? I completely agree. I think adapting is always good, tailoring to classes, changing it up a bit so it's not just a page of a book and it takes time though, that's what I think <laughs> you need. You need to have the energy and the time to do it. So I definitely have my days where I think, yeah, the book's enough. I'll just do it. When you say just do it, do you mean turn to page one, do yeah. exercise yeah. A and yeah. then work through this yeah. logically? I have those days. 
obviously it's better if you personalize that and try and keep the conversation going as well but yeah definitely do it but when I've got my teacher head on and I'm really focused and motivated I do enjoy adapting materials is that what you were thinking of it is basically what I was thinking of because you know Em that I started teaching in the classroom the physical classroom the physical classroom I was given a book and a cd and a tape recorder and pushed into a classroom that had a whiteboard and lots of students sitting at tables and um, I thought this is okay we could use the book we could go page by page exercise by exercise we'll use the audio that comes with this but over time I started to think there must be a different way to teach this and as you said personalizing seems like the right way to go yeah I think there's always scope for adapting no matter what the syllabus or the expectations from the student the director of the school from whoever was involved in the curriculum draw up the curriculum draw up okay sounds like a wild west thing but yes you have to take all that into account and decide if what you're working with is adaptable in the time constraints you have and if it's going to work because I mean we've all been there as teachers where you spend all day working on something and it's actually only a five minute exercise or You can only use it once. So I think it's worth bearing that in mind as well. Definitely. There are many considerations. Let me take you back into my classroom, Em. After a few weeks of teaching just in a very linear way, I started thinking maybe I could make a photocopy of a particular activity that I thought worked really well and helped the students understand the language we were practising in the classroom. (laughs) <laughs> make a photocopy was that your revelation what it was incredible i exploded em um, i exploded that image so big oh the image you didn't explode but you exploded the image so big that the what? students were amazed what are you talking about you just went in with a poster sized image something from the book yeah how did that in any way help them learn english because they could see (laughs) (laughs) because it was a really good activity and I think I put it up on the wall was and you you blew it up from the textbook yeah so it was supersized instead of the students having to open their book to Uh page 27 go to activity a I said look at this and I had a piece of paper like a o size well it was a bit bigger than just a4 i remember yeah. that much okay. and i put them in little groups and i said right this is our activity i want you to uh, make this into a conversation instead of a gap fill for example nice. see if we can do something totally different from what you should be doing according to the book i wrote some words on the board they worked together it was just really interactive. I get it now. Sorry. Now I've got the full picture. Yeah, I agree. I think just literally taking it out of the book and putting it on a wall or on a desk. So they're using it as a team. They're looking at the same page. It's genius. And you do have that light bulb moment, I think, as a teacher. Well, I did anyway, where you think this changes everything. This is the dynamic I want. I don't just want individual students sitting at a desk looking into a book head Heads down. down yes so i <laughs> now i understand i thought you were just talking about a photo or something but you could do that as well em it's limitless what we can do i want to take this conversation even further because i would like to know how do you adapt materials for dot 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 online lessons mm, it's a teeny bit harder I do send a lot of individual emails to people during my lessons. I'll say, right, I'm going to send you this document and the other group or the other students going to be sent a different document. So maybe you want to do pair work. Is this a jigsaw activity? Could be a jigsaw reading or something like that. You have to be good at small talk at that point and just filling in a few minutes because you don't know who's coming to the lesson. So maybe if you're really organised, you can send it before the lesson. But often I'm just in the middle of an online lesson thinking, actually, I'd rather the two students I've got today were working on this separately. So I'm just trying to fill this time while I send this email and I'm going to check what's in my inbox or something. And then I just talk to them about what's going on in their office or something. That is super cool. So you're teaching and preparing and sending out the materials 
tailored specifically for a group, knowing how many students there are and what activity you want to do. Yeah, because then you've got that dynamic again where they're not looking at the shared screen or something that they're all looking at at the same time. They've all got different information. You might want to do like a spot the difference picture or something like that. But that's not exactly adapting, is it, I guess? Um I can still copy paste things out of books onto separate pages so that they're all looking at something but not so much of a book format that just looks a bit more fun. Maybe. You're basically expanding the photocopy yeah. as I described earlier, but you're doing it on the screen. Yeah, you're zooming in on bits <laughs> that you might want to focus on instead of just the overall page. That's nice because I think when you look at the overall page, it is a bit dense. It can be a bit boring. It's a bit like, oh, no, here's another page of a student's exercise book we're learning English but yeah. focus in zoom in yeah. and you've got wow all right there's something a bit more dynamic happening here I often block bits of the book off as well so and how do you block off bits of the book make a text box on the page if it's a pdf so they're not focusing because you don't know where they're looking and that's the thing in the classroom that you don't know where they're looking either and I often have to go around saying, no, no, we're on this page. We're here on this bottom right side. And if you're actually looking at a screen together, you can just section it off so you know they're looking exactly at the bit you want them to. That is really good. Unless they're checking their email and uh, watching a YouTube video at the same time. Well, you're never going to know that, but you can only control it as much as you're able to. Do you do anything different, Gav? I think I do some pretty similar stuff. I also share my screen and share the materials online my email sometimes emails don't arrive or they get lost or mm. i send it to the wrong student or i send two <laughs> to the wrong student and none to the other student you've got to pay attention yeah and as i'm not ever so good at multitasking that might be something i do in advance yeah or not at all yeah sometimes you can drag and drop these documents into the screen you're using and sometimes you can't and sometimes you can't <laughs> and it's never going to work when you want it to so maybe you would avoid those sort of things. Um, adapting materials for students of different levels. Coming back to the email thing, maybe just send them different levels of difficulty. Maybe if you're working on vocabulary, give one group a slightly higher level group of words and the other group the easier words so they can discuss the meaning or something together or some platforms you can put them into breakout rooms. So they could actually go together into their levels, which would be quite good. And how about a group who have different levels? Could you use the same materials and somehow teach the two different level students using the same materials? I guess you just have to select the right student to answer the right question that you think they might be able to answer. I guess you could make the questions or answers or tasks a little bit more difficult for those higher level students and maybe a little bit more simple for the lower level students so you don't get them too stressed out. On the same page? Yeah. Maybe go in at a slightly lower level. You've got a text on an interesting topic and your students are A2 and B2, which does happen. Yeah. Taking a text that's closer to the A2 student, a bit too easy for the B2, but then really force the B2 student to go into much deeper details and maybe come up with a few synonyms for some of the language that's in the activity. That's nice. But even if what you're talking about goes over the head of the other student who's lower, you wouldn't mind if that student wasn't keeping up. I don't think it would be a problem. I don't mind writing some of the new language into the chat, for example, or on the board, just so that the lower level student can copy them into their notebook. Yeah, that would be really good too. Gav, give me one more situation. Another situation where I need you to adapt your materials um, is during a short lesson. Because I know that you've spent hours planning this lesson that's supposed to be two hours, two and a half hours. You've got your 20 activities. You've got your four books ready, all on the page that you need them. You've got the video set up, the audio recording set up. You've got a couple of websites you wanted to visit <laughs> during that. Your dictionary is open. You might have the translation app just at hand, just in case. And the student joins and says, I'm really sorry. I've only got 15 minutes. <laughs> Close all those windows, um, pack up and just have a 
chat, basically, <laughs> is what I would do. How have you been? What have you been up to? What are your plans for the Why weekend? have you only got 15 minutes? <laughs> Definitely could spend 15 minutes talking about that, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't even begin. Well, I I suppose I could begin. Em, as... I know you're going to begin. You're not going to simply be defeated by a lack of time. No, but I think if you're if you know the students are likely to do that again the next week, you could spend a month teaching one lesson if you did it in sections. I'm not sure you can, though, because once you really start going into that topic, then you have to stop and then you have to start all over again the next week. I'm not sure. I wouldn't start. That's what I'm saying. I would just avoid starting. You could begin, I guess, and do the first part of it, but it would take you a month to teach it if you only had 20 minutes a week. If you knew the student was going to be there next week, then you could say, okay, well, this is the topic for next week. We're just going to chat a bit first about the topic. And then hopefully you can start from the next lesson where you left off. But I don't think the continuity is going to work there. It's not there, there, is it? And it doesn't always work because the student might not come back and there might be a different group then and then you've got to start again. So I tend to just keep these lovely, big, chunky lessons for when I know everyone's there and they can stay there and I have other things in reserve, like quizzes or something, that they can just do for the 15 minutes and then they don't feel like they've lost out or they've started something and not finished it because I think that's frustrating for everyone. I think so too. Not exactly adapting, is it? It's just putting it on hold. Yeah, but it's not giving up, Em. No, no, it's just postponed. Can I come back, Gav, to something you've said before? You certainly can, Em. When you mentioned about the different levels of students, I'd like to go into that a little bit more because I have got classes with different levels of students. And it's quite a challenge. I'm finding it a little bit hard to get anywhere with the lower ones and to maintain or satisfy the expectations of the higher ones. And it somehow seems to be a sort of stagnation in the middle somewhere. Ah, okay. So you're teaching to the middle student. Yeah, which isn't there because there's only two of them. So there is no middle student. (laughs) It's not rewarding for anyone. No, it's not challenging enough for the higher one and it's too hard for the lower one. So it's not easy. Have you thought about separating them? No, it's not an option. Into two groups? It's not possible. So I have to make it work, which means a lot of micro teaching, a lot of separate conversations, a lot of explaining or repeating for the lower one and then a lot of eye rolls from the higher one. Have you got the higher level student to explain more to the lower level student or is this where the eyes are rolling? That's definitely a very good tip to get the higher level student to explain to the lower level. But I think you can't keep doing that because then it's just taking all the time up if you're trying to get to something. That might be a bit boring for the higher level student as well. Yeah, and maybe they think that's not up to them to do that so it's getting a little bit difficult actually the dynamics in that class are you still trying to push the higher level student and use some complex language and structures with them ask them some pretty difficult questions even completely ignoring the lower level student yes sometimes but i find it a lot to keep thinking about the needs of both i come out of it feeling a bit lost sometimes I still think you might want to just focus on one student at a time. And I think the higher level student will think, okay, for the next five minutes, teacher M is going to focus on the lower level student and I'll just, um, I don't know, clean my fingernails. Mm. And then the lower level student, while you're teaching the higher level student, will think, oh, I have no idea what's going on, but I'm sure this is good for me. Yeah, okay. So maybe I shouldn't be trying to please everyone. I should be just focusing one on the other and mixing it up a bit more and yeah that is a good way to think about it. I think you have to show the high level student that your expectations are very very high and you will not accept a simple answer to any of your questions or any of the structures they use must be more complex than the lower level student's going to use. Mm-hmm. Yeah it's a lot to think about. It is a lot to think about. I often compare it to spinning plates. And what's that mean? You know, when you go to the circus and you see somebody spinning plates on little sticks and imagine 
one of your students is one of the plates and you have to sort of focus on them, keep them spinning around, keep them happy, keep them focused, keep them engaged while the other spinning plate is on the other stick in your other hand. And that one is going to start wobbling if you don't focus on that toe. So you've got to just keep going back and forth and make sure everybody is enjoying themselves, is focused, is learning something. When they're not, give them a push. A spin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're right. And it does require adaptation of the materials and it does require constantly monitoring them, checking everybody's focused. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. It is a lot. That brings us to, Gav, Quiz of the Week. M and the followers, this week's quiz is in fact not even a quiz. Oh, what is it? It's just um, some article that I picked up from glamourmagazine.co.uk. I like that magazine. It's titled Articles Slash Questions Ask Friends. Right, so it's just questions of the week. Sort of. Okay. My idea, Em, is that you might have a class and they say, we'd like to do some speaking practice and use all of the new language that we've just been taught, please, Teacher Gav. They wouldn't be calling me Teacher Gav, would they? They'd be calling me Teacher Em. But yeah, I get what you mean. I'm talking about myself now, Em. Right. So I found a nice set of questions that you might want to ask and answer with your students. Of course, we can make it into a quiz. We could all take turns answering the questions and whoever gives the best answer gets a point. And then it's a game, it's a contest, it's a competition, M, that one of us, only one of us, can win. Is that the definition of a quiz then, where there's a winner? Because I thought it means there's a question that you must have only one answer to. But anyway, let's <laughs> carry on, shall we? M, according to Oxford Languages, a quiz is a test of knowledge, especially as a competition between individuals or teams as a form of entertainment. You know oh. what that tells me? What? We're both right. I think so. As usual, M. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not as usual. <laughs> I'm usually right. Let's begin by you telling me a number between 1 and 25. I'll ask you the question and we'll both answer and the followers will decide who gives the best answer. Are you ready? Mm. <laughs> yes. Seven. Question seven. How much does your personality change when you're around different people? My answer is quite a lot because I am like a sponge and I soak up the energy and the vibe and reflect it. I'm like a sponge with a mirror connected to it because then I reflect it back onto them. Are you soaking or reflecting or sponging or... What is that answer telling me? I'm like a full bathroom suite. I've got the whole thing going on. Absorption, reflection, it's all of that. I really like that answer. That was a good answer. It's not up to you to judge, Gav. It's up to you to give your answer. I'm just being polite. Okay. And my personality also changes a lot when I'm teaching. So with some groups, I am super confident. I'm loud. I'm shouty. I won't take any nonsense with others. I am very calm, very relaxed, and I've got quite a soothing voice. So you do what the group requires. You kind of check what's going on and then you adapt accordingly or you generate that vibe. I'm the one that decides the mood, really, to be honest with you. If I want a high, active vibrant class, then I'll bring that to them and it will fit really well with the materials we've got for that day. But if we want a more chilled out lesson, I'll say, OK, this is what we're doing today. Mm, interesting. Number 13. Unlucky for some. But maybe not you. Here we go. What's the nicest thing someone has done for you? Oh, well, basically make me tea is the best thing anyone can do for me. Has anyone ever made you tea, Em? Yes, many people, many times. So it's always a nice day if someone makes me a cup of tea. Em, do you know what the nicest thing someone has ever done for me? I have no idea. They have bought me a coffee. Oh, hello. Plug, plug away. From coffee, ko-fi.com forward slash how to English pod. And it really does make our day, doesn't it? You're right. It really does. 
Virtual tea, real tea, I'm happy either way. I wonder how many points we've got so far, Em. Followers, let us know. (laughs) Yeah. Gav, that's our second question. What's the third one? Give me a number between 1 and 25. That's right. That's what I need to do. (laughs) 24. What do you think is the most annoying quality a person can have? (sighs) Annoying. That's very specific. Annoying. You might want to think about a student in your class, gets on your nerves, gets your goat, boils your blood. Maybe interrupting is a bit annoying. Don't they don't let me finish. Interrupting you, Em? Yeah. They don't let me finish my <laughs> What about interrupting each other? Sentence. Yeah. I think that makes me more annoyed is when they interrupt each other. When, when the interrupt- students in- <laughs> we're doing a lot of interrupting. When the students interrupt each other. I mean when the students interrupt each other. Yeah. And you have to say Hold on. Let that person just finish their point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Hang on. You're giving your... Is that your answer too? Is it the same as mine? Can't be the same as mine. My answer, Em, the most annoying quality, and I've changed person to student, (laughs) a student can have, is when they don't listen to my corrections and they continue making the same mistakes all the time. Oh, that is annoying. For example, they don't say... Clothes. They say cloves. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's going to be hard to decide. I all think right. both of those are very, very annoying. Followers, let us know, is it M or Gav who is the winner of this week's... Quiz of the Week! Questions. That was nice. I will definitely... Get that link from you, Gav, later, because those are fun questions and you can adapt them, as we did, to talk about our jobs and our students rather than generally. So it's nice, nice bit of demoing there. It worked really well. So that just leaves us to say thank you, everyone, for coming back week after week, listening to Gavin M's How to English pod. Teffel pod. Teffel pod. Catch you next time, Em. Can't wait.